Hello! In this video we will discuss how economists rely on empir empirical regularities to learn more about the world. In this plot, we show the rates of change for prices in the US, or in other words, US inflation, and the change in the number of dollars you need to purchase a euro. As we can see in the plot, the two seem to go fairly hand in hand. Does it mean that they are related somehow? Does it mean that we can re rationalize this relationship? In fact, what you are seeing here is precisely the relative purchasing power parity theory of nominal exchange rate determination in action, which will be the last topic of the course. However, it is good to remind ourselves that indeed correlation doesn't mean causation. Just because two aspects of reality seem to co-move, it doesn't mean that there is a causal relationship between them. For example, the age of Miss America's winning contest and the number of murders by steam and hot objects is highly correlated, as you can see in this plot. But I think it would take a high degree of imagination to come up with a story that would make a plausible connection between the two. This leads to a problem. How do we distinguish causation from spurious correlation? Economics is a social science so there are practical and ethical obstacles on what kind of approaches we can have in order to learn more about the world. Typically, economists tend to infer causality in two ways, which are not necessarily substitutes, but more on that later. The first is to resort events that, given the practical and ethical obstacles referred, resemble experiments similar to the ones performed in a lab. The second is to build theories, stories, models that make compelling arguments on why two aspects of reality may be connected through a causal relationship. Let's start with the first approach. In the end of the 1970s, Jimmy Carter and Fidel Castro entertained a series of initiatives to de-escalate diplomatic tensions between the US and Cuba, leading to the easing of travel arrangements between the two countries. In April 1980, Castro announced that any Cuban that would want to leave Cuba could do so at the port of Mariel. This led to a mass exodus in what became known as the Mariel boat lift. Tens of thousands of people started to arrive at the shores of Florida, leading Carter to mobilize the Coastal Guard for a blockade to many ships crossing the Gulf. About 1,400 ships were seized, but many passed, and more than 125,000 Cubans reached the US. This led to severe political pressure, and Mariel Boatliff ended in October 1980 by mu mutual agreement of Cuba and the US. This episode provided fertile ground for labor economists to think about the effect of immigration on native employment and wages. The problem in just looking at the correlation between immigration and native job market outcomes is that they both respond to economic conditions. So if times are good, the region attracts immigrants, and at the same time, native job market becomes better. If we don't take those economic conditions into account, we might be tempted to say that more immigration improves native job prospects, when it could be in the limit that there is no relationship between them, and both are just responding to the bettering of economic conditions. So, how to tell? The Mario boat leaf constitutes a natural experiment in the sense that the decision of Cubans to immigrate to the US were unrelated to changes in economic conditions and was an artifact purely of diplomatic relations at the government level. This way, economists studied the impact of this wave of migration under the assumption that it was clean from any other confounding effect and safely infer the causal impact of immigration on natives' jobs outcomes. To put this kind of analysis in practice, economists use tools and methods as difference and differences, regression discontinuity, instrumental variables, and so forth. All different ways of achieving the same goal, to isolate some variation in the cause variable that is clean from confounding factors that can be used then to infer causation in the targeted variable. 
The advantages of this kind of approach is that they are technically simple and conditional on the identification assumption being met, that in fact there, are, there were no confounding factors in the material boat lift at play, has strong internal validity since it typically resorts to very simple linear relationships between the variables. However, there are some disadvantages too. First, external validity. At best, all we learn is the impact of the metal boat lift immigration wave on wages in Florida between April and October 1980. Could those effects, even if proven to be causal, be extrapolated to think about the impact of refugee crisis in natives' job market prospect in Europe before the pandemic? Also, what these experiments typically measure is an average impact. David Card, a Berkeley professor, did publish in an article in 1980 where he found no effects of the metal boat leaf on native wages. However, in 2017, Borges found that there is, in principle, possible significant effects on high and low wages, such that on average, the effect cancels out. It so happened that most of the Cubans in the metal boat lift were high school dropouts. And when you compare the wages of natives with the same education status, the impact was found to be negative and between 10 to 30%. The biggest drawback is perhaps the fact that with this, these experiments, we don't really learn much about the mechanism through which one factor has a causal impact on the other. The impact of Cuban immigrants on native job prospects can express themselves through a variety of mechanisms. Knowing the why and how is as important because when thinking in terms of policies, some will be more effective than others, precisely depending on how the causal effect of, for example, immigration on job market dynamics expresses itself. Let's now look at the second approach we mentioned earlier. How to learn about relationship between aspects of reality by constructing arguments often expressed in mathematical terms, that when put together, put up a compelling theory rationalizing such relationships. These arguments impose structures on observations that then can be validated or refuted by looking at the data. Examples of these theories are the solo model, the real business cycle model, and the new Keynesian model. All theories that we will work with later in the course. The main advantages are that these models impose structures on data that are derived from first principles. For example, the relationship between consumption, saving, and income is derived from an individual utility maximization problem that clearly illustrates the mechanism through which these variables are related. However, there are also inconveniences with this approach. There is an infinite number of theories that can fit the same facts. And in order to distinguish, be distinguish between them, we need to resort to further validation of other relationships the theories also impose on the data. These two approaches, in fact, are more complements than substitutes. Any theory will take some exogenous structure, parts of the model that have no theoretical foundation, such as parameters, as a base on which it builds the arguments that will make predictions regarding the target variables. For the purpose of the theory, the experimental approach can be useful in estimating these structures. On the other hand, the theory can imply relationship between variables that can be tested resorting to the experimental approach. So more than substitutes, these approach are complements. However, in the context of this course, since it is broad course on the discipline of macroeconomics, we will focus more on building intuition and therefore rely on theories and how their predictions conform with observed data. It is always good to remind the words of Ragnar Frisch, the first Nobel laureate together with Jan Timbergen, that already back in 1933 stated that statistical information is currently accumulating at an unprecedented rate. But no amount of statistical information, however complete and exact, can by itself explain economic phenomena. If we are not to get lost in the overwhelming, bewildering mass of statistical data that are now becoming available, we need the guidance and help 
of a pow powerful theoretical framework. Without these, no significant interpretation and coordination of our observations will be possible. So long as we confine ourselves to statement in general terms about one economic factor having an effect on some other factor, almost any sort of relationship may be selected, postulated as a law and explained by a plausible argument.